dieses Jahr bis morgen. of that. 
you will see pictures of the children sitting in law school and behaving themselves, coloring. You will see all that, and that's evidence that comes to you directly from something concrete. It's not something that is yelled at you at the top of one's voice. It is merely and completely a true artifact of the time period that you are being asked to sit in judgment for. Lots of times, Joseph was not there. Joseph suffers from cystic fibrosis and diabetes. He frequently had to go to the doctor, had to go to hospital visits, and so he was not there on most occasions. He was frequently, on those occasions, Jennifer would pack them up and take the girls with her, wherever she went. Were, was it to class, to commission meetings? Because yes, as Ms. Young told you, she was running for Henry County Commissioner. So she took them to commission meetings. She took them with her wherever she went. She, the Rosenbaums loved the girls, and the girls loved the Rosenbaums. You will hear from defects workers that the girls were comfortable in the home and that they loved on Joe and Jennifer. You will hear evidence that the children participated in extracurricular activities and went to church daycare. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard wild accusations against the Rosenbaums, wild accusations against the defense. And I ask you just to hold the state to its burden and to their lies and to their misstatements too. Because as you will see, the children did go to daycare. You will also see that the state is misinformed they went to daycare, they went to church, they were with babysitters, they were with Rosenbaums, they were with other people. Millie, in particular, enjoyed gymnastics. And you're going to hear a lot about gymnastics. You're going to see pictures taken from that time, not recent pictures all doctored up, as the state would have you see you will see pictures from that time of what the gym looked at that time. You will hear evidence that Layla had taken a class with her mommy, with Jennifer. She took a pre-class to see if she would be in, really interested in doing that. And then after that, she would accompany her big sister to class Jennifer would stay and watch them, and Layla would be there as well. They also had regular doctor's visits at this time, and you will hear that there is no, absolutely no evidence of abuse at that time, or at any time during the three and a half months that these children were with the Rosenbaums. You will hear about the fractured leg. And this occurred over some time. It was not due to gymnastics. It was due to a combination of things. Millie told Jennifer that Layla fell at her Nana's house in a hole. And Layla, in fact, was favoring her leg. And Jennifer noticed that. But it seemed to be getting better. There was a visit to, to gymnastics, and the girls were playing on the bars. The equipment was out there, and people, unlike what you might expect, parents were allowed the run of the place, and they were able to play on the equipment unsupervised. Layla was playing on the bars with her mother. She slipped off the bar and fell on the mat. No one thought anything of it. No one filed a report. No one thought there was any problem. Later, when the child was unable to put any weight on the foot, they went to the doctor. 
And what ensued was not claims of child abuse, but putting the child in a soft cast, directing the child be placed in a hard cast, and that was all done. Like most younger folks today, Jennifer and Joseph took pictures of everything. They took pictures constantly. You will see those pictures. There are over 2,000 pictures that were taken of these girls. That is not what an abuser does. They documented their lives with Layla and Millie by photographing them and trying to build memories of their time together, a time they thoroughly enjoyed. Then tragedy struck. And you're going to hear Miss Lambert talk about a bruise here, a bruise there. You also see and hear defects workers tell you unequivocally they saw those bruises too, and they were in fact healing. They were not fresh bruises that were done by the Rosenbaums as they visited with these girls. And you heard Miss Young tell you that this child started her life with the Rosenbaums in a hospital. Well, let's talk about the truth instead of manufacturing the truth here. Let's talk about the truth. What happened the first time they had her, they went to a party, to a barbecue, out, employees barbecue for Spalding County. The child ate, the child seemed fine, and then the child started throwing up. She returned the child and said, the child's throwing up. The child was taken to the emergency room and in fact had a viral infection. Now to blame a viral infection on the Rosenbaums is a little much. And you will hear that this viral infection was throughout the household in which the child was living at the time. Tragedy struck on November 17th and their lives would be changed forever by that. While eating dinner, Layla began to choke on a piece of chicken tender. Not a chicken bone, as has been reported by the media. Not, not a piece of bone, but a chicken tender. Jennifer was the only one home at the time, and how do we know this? Because Joseph was at Spalding County Correctional Institute where he worked. She reacted instinctively to help Layla. And what the state keeps talking about is CPR, CPR, CPR. What they don't mention, and I did not hear said once in opening statement, was about Heimlich maneuver. And you will hear that there is literature, in the medical literature, about the Heimlich maneuver and how if misapplied, not done properly, it can cause the rupturing of pancreas. That is documented. The doctors will talk to you about it. You will hear about this. Not from the state, but you will hear about it from the defense. The defense is going to bring to you, even though we have no burden to do so, don't have to do a thing, we are going to be called in a number of witnesses. We are going to be calling the former medical director of the GBI. And he is going to help you go through the medical evidence and see it for what it really is. And I ask you to wait to make your decision until such time as you have heard from everybody. It's very easy to do what the state and the media have done in this case, which is just sensationalize it to the guilt and not care about the due process rights, not care about the fact that what has to be done is it has to be tried in a court of law. If you heard the state's opening argument, the immediate question is, why in the world are these people here? Why are they pleading, signing their name, and said not guilty? 
everyone knows if you plead guilty, you get a better deal? Why are they saying they're not guilty? They're saying they're not guilty because they're not guilty, they're innocent. She reacted instinctively to Layla by attempting the Heimlich maneuver. And she did that over and over again. And you will hear that that involved the back and the chest and the stomach. And you will hear that Jennifer was not trained in either CPR or Heimlich maneuver. What she did was what she saw on TV. And unfortunately, what that meant was the child was subjected to adult CPR and adult Heimlich maneuver. You will hear from the doctors that there is, and from the EMTs, that there is a reason why you do not do adult CPR and adult Heimlich maneuver on a child. You do not use your two hands to do compressions like you see done for adults. You do not pound on the back like you see done for adults. What you do is you use two fingers and you press gently back and forth. That is not what happened to Layla, unfortunately, that night. And that haunts Jennifer and will live with her forever. <coughs> she did CPR. She did the Heimlich maneuver over and over again. She used a knife to hold down the tongue while she swept trying to get the food out. You will hear that the child threw up. In fact, there was chicken in the sink. Jennifer had the child up against the sink, and the child ejected the chicken so that explains why they didn't find anything in the throat. You will hear Jennifer's 911 call. <clears throat> you will hear how she's trying to take direction. By the time Layla, the paramedics had arrived, Layla was still alive, but just barely. She died shortly thereafter on her way or at the hospital. You will hear that the EMTs and the police left Millie with Jennifer. Millie and Jennifer came to the hospital together. You will hear from Samantha White who is the caseworker assigned to Jennifer and Joe's foster parenting of these children, tell you that she could hear Jennifer's wailing from the minute Jennifer got there. She was in the hospital and Jennifer was in the parking lot. <coughs> yes, you can be sarcastic and try and malign Jennifer and Joseph. You will hear people say, well, she didn't cry when I saw her. But you will hear that she cried mightily when she got to the hospital. She cried mightily when she could, when she was grieving. And we don't all grieve the same way. hospital and the events were about to take a turn that neither Jennifer nor Joseph could have anticipated. What was a horrible accident was going to be turned into a vendetta against these two folks. A vendetta that has continued 
to this very day, to this very minute, when Miss Young got up here and continued that vendetta. <clears throat> Someone has to be blamed. A child is dead. Someone has to pay. And what they're doing is mixing bad medicine together with sensationalism and blaming the first easy target instead of looking for the truth of the matter and seeing what really happened and seeing it for the accident it was. During the course of this trial, you're going to hear a lot of evidence about Jennifer and Joseph, mainly about Jennifer. You will hear that Jennifer, a young lawyer in training, could be brash. She spoke her mind. She enjoyed getting involved in politics. She was running for county commissioner. She was an up-and-comer in the legal community. You will hear that at times she could be critical and outspoken against politicians, and that eventually she sought to run for office against an incumbent who was very much liked. She sought to run against him, and that did not please the powers that be. You will hear that Jennifer did not hide her views and didn't hesitate to speak her mind. She made enemies in Henry County government. She criticized her opponent. She criticized the police chief of Henry County and referred to some officials as corrupt. This is not how you make friends, but Jennifer is young, and she saw herself speaking truth to power of trying to change what she perceived to be a culture of corruption in local government. As a result, when this accident occurred, there was no shortage of folks to relish her comeuppance. Her political opponents set out to make sure she was painted in the worst light possible. This fervor took on a life of its own and as the evidence will show, the police, three DA's offices, and the press all rushed to judgment and labeled the death a murder instead of seeing it for the terrible accident that it was. An accident gets a brief mention in the paper. But if you can talk about a killing, as Ms. Young put it, a murder, and about liars, that becomes grist for the media to sensationalize the story, boost their ratings, and they're here doing exactly that today, and we'll be here for the next week, three weeks that we will be here. In the end, that destroyed the lives of Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum who were only trying to improve their community and make the lives of these two children better. You heard the indictment, 49 counts. How many counts does it take to say murder, aggravated assault? Do you need 49 different times to assert it? That is more vendetta against Joseph and Jennifer. There are 49 counts. There must be something to it. And that's the deception, it's the deceptive part on the part of the state. They are wanting you to decide based on emotion and alarm. The indictment of Jennifer and Joseph turned the public against them before the first piece of evidence was examined. You will see how this rush to judgment poisoned witnesses. You will see how the community was led to believe, for example, that Layla had been starved. That was a story that went through the press at one point. 
you will see that that was a notion made popular by Detective Thompson, the leading detective in the case. He came up with this idea all on his own, without a scrap of medical evidence, based on his seeing Layla once at the hospital and deciding she had been starved. He took out the warrants, saying she'd been charged, starved, and that was communicated in some way to the media and then to the general public. That mistake informed his conversations with witnesses and family members, and as a result, you will hear that Millie, after she was left in the care of her biological mother and her great-grandmother, Millie was said to have exclaimed to one of the foster mothers, they don't put food in our bellies. Or on another occasion, that Jennifer fed Millie, but not Layla. The truth, however, is not what Detective Robinson stated and took out in his warrants. The truth is that according to the state's own doctors and according to the medical examiner that the state used, both girls were well nourished. That means they were well fed. But that is not sensational. And that is not reported. Another notion put forth by the police was the idea that because Layla's anus was dilated, she had been sexually abused. That ran around town. You will hear that this too was a total fabrication either based on ignorance or an intent to malign Jennifer and Joseph. The truth of the matter you will hear is that there was no abuse, sexual or otherwise, and that the dilation of the anus is a normal occurrence when a child dies. It's a normal biological function of the body shutting down. But before they came to this conclusion, the state had sought warrants for DNA and had released this information to the wider public, prejudicing the community against Jennifer and Joseph by passing along information that was manifestly untrue. You are going to hear accusations that when the girls were with the boys and bombs, they showed up with bruises. And you will see the pictures of these bruises, and you will, you will hear about, basically, you're going to hear about the type of bruises that children get into, especially children who are rough and tumble. And you will hear that these girls played and they played hard. The bruise, the scratch to the knee, the knock under the eye, a bruise on the, on the wrist. Those bruises that you will hear Ms. Lambert talk about were bruises that occurred before the Rosenbaums came on the watch. You will hear that those bruises were healed, were healing and old. You will hear that Defax was made aware of them and that they made a conscious decision that these were a, healing and old, and even if they were Rosenbaum's watch, they were the regular rough and tumble type bruises that kids get. <clears throat> then you will hear that the child had these other bruises, the bruises that were documented and talked about by the state. Her back was covered in a bruise. And what you're going to hear, again, misstatements that you're going to hear, is old injuries and new injuries. You're going to hear that the bruises, according to the state, were in stages of healing. And you will also hear that contrary to what the state says and the police told 
Samantha White, bruises cannot be dated. It used to be thought that bruises progressed according to a color chart, and that you could tell the date of a bruise from its color. That is no longer valid science. And you will hear that from Dr. Sperry, and I imagine you will hear that from Dr. Beresoff, who is the medical examiner in this case. However, that story was perpetuated and it too reached the ears of the witnesses, the family. And the conclusion was exactly what Ms. Young said here today, oh, she's been beating her every day of her life. The truth of the matter is that those bruises were acquired on November 17th when Jennifer tried to save this child's life. It is outrageous to suggest otherwise. You will hear she had that extensive bruising on November 17th. Again, what you will not hear is as important she did not have that bruising on November 16th. She did not have that bruising on November 15th. She did not have that bruising on November 14th. And the reason was it all happened on November 17th. And the reason for that is that it was caused, bruising was caused essentially by Jennifer's efforts to save her while performing the Heimlich maneuver, pressing hard on her chest while trying to dislodge the chicken, blocking her throat, which she eventually did dislodge. Jennifer bent Layla over a sink to allow her to vomit and to try and force the chicken out. Unfortunately, she was just doing what she had seen done on TV. The result is that without intending to do so, Jennifer exerted pressure that went right through Layla's torso, lacerating her liver and tearing the pancreas in the process. But you will also hear that the Heimlich maneuver is known to do that, if not applied correctly. At some point, we're going to hear about the word intent, whether there was an intent to kill, an intent to harm. There will be no evidence of an intent to kill or to harm. It'll be up to you to decide whether Jennifer intended to kill Layla. You will hear her actions, you will hear her voice, you will hear her speak. As we believe the evidence will show, she accidentally caused the death in her haste and panic to revive and save her. And you will hear Dr. Sperry say, this child was not killed on November 17th. This child suffered injuries as a result of resuscitated efforts. <clears throat> you will hear from witnesses who were around these children. You will see photographs, and you will see that these children were not abused, not bruised, cut, or marked up. They were not kept hidden from the public. To the contrary, you will see and hear that Jennifer took these children everywhere with her, to the zoo, to school events, parades, opening of art centers. You will hear from these witnesses that Jennifer and the children were very close. You will hear that they hung on her and that she was very proud and happy to be taken care of her. There will be evidence that Millie was questioned 
over and over and over again. You will also hear about forensic interviewing. Forensic interviewing, when it comes to children, is the means by which you are supposed to interview children. You're not supposed to ask them questions. You're not supposed to let their mother ask them questions. You take them to a forensic interviewer, and that forensic interviewer is trained and asks non-leading questions, non-conclusory questions, and gets, hopefully, the truth as a result of that. You will hear about various two or three forensic interviews that this child had, and at no point did she give a statement saying that Jennifer or Joseph did anything, knew anything, said anything, nothing. She laughed when it was suggested that she might have been abused. She laughed when they talked about, were you physically punished? You will hear that each time she told the interviewer, the caseworker, and medical pro professional that she did not hear or see anything, and no one ever heard her or her sister, except for Layla's father, Anthony Daniel, who touched her private parts. She was asked about bruises on her body, and those bruises were not pattern bruises. They were not belt marks, electric cord marks, but bruises you get from being active, rough and tumble, four-year-olds. And she said she got those from falling down while playing and while doing gymnastics. But that was not what they wanted to hear. So. What did they do? They sent the child to therapist. She didn't say anything. Sent her to another therapist. Meanwhile, she's living with her mother and her grandmother, great-grandmother. And then, all of a sudden, the child started repeating things that she had heard. You will hear. In this courtroom, the latest revision, you will hear that all through the time that she was asked, there were different stories. You will hear that the parents, she's now adopted, she and her two other sisters, Tessa had two children during the time these uh, events were unfolding. Those two children and um, Millie are now placed, they're now adopted by Amanda Harrell. Millie is Millie Harrell at this point. You will hear what is the latest revision of history. She has grown, as she has grown older, her memory of being four years old has gotten clearer instead of fuzzier. You will hear that her adoptive mother was concerned that she was making stuff up. You will hear that her mother and her great-grandmother went to the doctor to try and find out why she lies so much. So keep that in mind when you listen to Millie and to what she has to say today. That she has been subjected to three forensic interviews, countless amounts of questioning and talk by her mother and great-grandmother. You will also hear that the therapists were concerned because she had been privy to inappropriate conversations by her mother and great-grandmother. You're not going to hear much about Joseph, because Joseph wasn't at home when Layla choked on the chicken. He was working two jobs. He was not able to spend as much time with the girls as Jennifer did. He stayed with them when his wife had an exam, when his wife had to go to school, and when he was available, but often 
the girls were asleep, playing with each other, or on the tablet when he was home from work. There will be no evidence that this man was aware of anything. And the reason why is nothing happened in that house until November 17th, when Jennifer tried to save that child's life. He did not know about any abuse because there was no abuse to know of. Even Millie said he was good to them. Yet he's here. Again, why is he here? Because the police and the district attorneys have rushed to judgment and figured if they charged him, he would be so terrified, he would testify against his wife. That's all they wanted. But that would require Joseph to lie. There will be no, I repeat, no evidence that he saw, should have seen, believed, should have believed that his wife was abusing the girls, and that's because she wasn't. The unavoidable truth of the matter is that accident happens, and that sometimes accidents, accidents cannot be prevented. You have well-meaning, individuals who intend to save the child's life, administering the wrong kind of resuscitative efforts, and instead going through the pancreas and the liver in the efforts to revive this child. The law deals with accidents through the concept of intent. If there was no intent to cause harm, if there was no malice, there's no criminal responsibility. The evidence will show that Jennifer and Joseph's only intent was to provide a loving home for their two foster children, and that Jennifer's efforts to save Layla before and while on the phone with 911 resulted in a tragic accident she will have to live with for the rest of her life. You will not see one iota of evidence that shows she ever intended to harm Layla, much less that she and Joseph abused her or her sister. You will hear plenty of evidence, on the other hand, that the Henry County Police and the District Attorney's Office saw this case as an opportunity to put a woman who had been a thorn in their side in her place to poison the community's mind towards this couple and ruin their lives. Now they are placing their lives in your hands, trusting that you will live up to your oath. And I'm going to ask you to take their lives as seriously as you possibly can. Listen to the evidence. <clears throat> Listen to what the people say and question everything. That's why you're here. It's not a decided matter, much as the press would like to make it out to be. It's not a decided matter until you say it's a decided matter. You should listen to the evidence as it comes from the witness stand and from the exhibits, as the judge has told you. Not from the press, not from the newspaper, not from the TV. <coughs> After you have done that, I will be back up here to ask you to return a verdict of not guilty on all counts because a verdict is Latin for speaking the truth. And the truth of the matter in this case is that Jennifer tried to save that child's life on November 17th. Jennifer did everything she could to save that child's life. 
That is the truth. I thank you for keeping an open mind, and I thank you for the service to the cause of justice. Okay, thank you, Ms. Small.